So hello and welcome. My name's Steve Nabell and today I'm speaking with John Matthews on the Celtic Shaman's Pack. Now John has been a full-time writer since 1980 and has produced over 100 books on myth, fairy, the Arthurian legends and Grail studies, as well as short stories, uh, a volume on poetry and several successful children's books. He lives in Oxford, England with his wife and the writer Caitlin and also a white cat named Willow and his website is helloquest.org.uk. There will be a link going out with this podcast now. The Celtic Shamans Pack offers a direct connection to the inner cosmos of the Celts, enabling you to make contact with many of the powerful archetypes to be found there. So, John, welcome to you. Hello, Steve. Hi. Now, how on earth did you get interested in this whole, I know you've been doing it for a long time, the Celtic era, Arthurian legends, you know, shamanism. I think all of those things go back to my childhood. Uh, well, perhaps not the shamanism so much, but certainly Celtic and Arthurian. Um, I mean, I read a, a, a collection um, of stories about King Arthur when I was in uh, when I was about, um, oh, I don't know, eight or nine, mm. and literally fell in love with them. Um, and as I grew up, I began reading more and more, um, and then I started writing about it. And that led inevitably to the Celtic, because the Celtic is such a large part of the Arthurian stories. Mm. Um, so I, I started working on the Celtic. And for a long time, this was back in the time when Carlos Castaneda was the big news. And people would often say to either Catan or myself, um, you know, is there a Celtic shamanic tradition? And we would usually say there's no evidence for it. But we began to realize after a while, working on all this material, that there was in fact a very strong uh, shamanic tradition within the Celtic world. It simply wasn't being noticed. Mm -hmm. So we started to research. We began to look at the poetry of the 6th century Welsh bard Taliesin. And we found within that poetry um, a whole tradition uh, that had almost been forgotten uh, in which he was describing uh, shamanic experiences. So um, I wrote a book about this, um, Taliesin, The Last Celtic Shaman. And while I was writing that, I began to realize that I wanted to teach it as well. Mm -hmm. And so we began to explore that and started um, teaching our foundation courses of Walkers Between Worlds. And that's really what we've been doing ever since. We both teach it. We've both developed it hugely. And uh, we have, you know, four or five courses a year now. Wonderful. Now, as you mentioned, Carlos Castaneda, I think since uh, his time and, and beyond, shamanism's uh, had a kind of renaissance of interest. Why, why do you think this is? I think it's, it's popular today because it gives you a different view on the world, because it gives you a chance to look at, if you like, the inside aspect of life. Um, not just the inner in that uh, magical sense, but also the hidden aspects of, of just living and being in this world. Well, did, did the Celts have a very different world through from our own? I mean, here I am in the modern world in London looking out on a very different landscape. You know, there's the internet, there's a very busy city. And of course, it was very different in the Celts' time. What about spirituality as well? You know, they must have had a very different spiritual worldview than their own. I think so. I mean, you have to remember that the Celts, first and foremost, were a warrior race. There was a great emphasis on, on the strength of individuals, uh, you know, their skills in, in battle and riding and everything else. Uh, that went on at that time, but they also had a very deep and powerful association with the land itself, you know, all of the earth, every aspect of it, every hill, every valley, every river, every tree had a story, and mm. they were, you know, they, they, were all to, they were all connected to gods or spirits. Um, there's a wonderful collection of uh, stories that you can still get hold of uh, called the Din Henekas, which are from Ireland, and these are actually a huge collection of stories about the land and stories that took place there. So you can look at a hill or a stream uh, and you have a story about it. And I think that, was, that is, is a very strong evidence to how important uh, these things were for them. So I guess uh, that means that they were treated the land very differently. We don't seem to respect the earth very much. I know there's a renaissance of eco, you know, interest in the green world. But do you think that, that is there any evidence that they really took looked after the world? I think that they were, you know, they felt it was so so spiritual that they they left it alone rather than, you know, attacking mm. as we always do today. You know, now we're all about taking everything there is to get from it and leaving it exhausted. 
Mm -hmm. um, I think they were, they knew about looking after the place and 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 understanding how in their uh, relationship to it, as in in um, both hunting and uh, farming, they were much more aware of the needs of a particular place than we are now. You run shamanic courses, John. Now the shaman's often been described as a walker between the worlds. What what what, what does this actually mean? Well, it means well. In order to be a shaman or to practice shamanism, you have to believe that there is an invisible world around you. And I think that walkers between the worlds is simply a way of saying that we move from this world to that world, and then from that world back to this. And that other world is the world of spirit. Uh, it's a world where everything is sacred, where everything is magical and holy. And uh, you go there and you encounter the beings that dwell in that place, and you work with them, and you form a team, and uh, that's how that's how it works. Basically, it's it's both very simple and very complex. Well, I guess in modern times, if we want to connect with the spirit world, we might go to a workshop or see a medium. And in the Victorian times, there were seances. How did they do it in the Celtic times? Well, nothing like that at all. Um, I mean. Mediumship is really about looking for something that may or may not be there, and if you're lucky, you find it. It's shooting in the dark. Apologies to mediums out there. I'm not being harsh <laughs> on you, um, but I'm just. But with with shamanism, you you have techniques. Uh, the most important one is use is use of the drum. Uh, we all we all use drums in our in our practice, and uh, you drum to a certain rhythm, and people basically lie down and go into a kind of very light trance. Nothing dangerous or, or, or manipulative in any way. You simply go out of this ordinary everyday consciousness into uh, a sort of super consciousness where you're aware of, um, of, of the other space and the other beings that are there and get advice from them, help from them, guidance from them, and most of all important, healing from them. It's, it's much more natural, if you might, if you like. Yeah. I mean, one of the things that really impresses me about shamanism is this very strong interest uh, in the ancestors, which the deck also covers. They're part of also part of the spirit world, aren't they? Very much so. Yes, I mean, um, we we all feel very strongly that most of the knowledge that we have that comes from this. Of course, you can study shamanic traditions, and you can study Celtic traditions, and you can see parallels. But when it comes down to actually doing it, uh, is another matter entirely. Uh, and I think it's that uh, that subtle interplay between um, between the past and the present, between the other world and this world, and especially between our, us now and the ancestors. Now, ancestors in this context doesn't necessarily mean your uncle or your aunt or your grandfather. It means primal ancestors. It means the the proto ancestors of the whole human race. So you're going down to something very deep and very ancient when you communicate with them and they are the holders of the wisdom and the knowledge and that's why you work with them and 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 seek their advice because they know more than we do i i don't i don't know if you know um this the guy um bert hellinger who does the kind of family constellation but he he works with the zulu tribe in africa and he talked he he was told by them that all illness comes is, is an ancestral problem you know is this a typical shamanic view um, it is quite largely understood to be true. Yes, um, I mean, if you have a broken leg, you don't go and see the shaman. You go and see, you go and see a doctor. Yeah. Um, you know, if you have a serious illness, you go and see a doctor. We're not there to stand instead of normal medication. But there are the kinds of problems, the very subtle kinds of things, where people have suffered from something for a very long time. They've been to the doctor. They've had no diagnosis. They don't know what's wrong. Um, and their life may be in a mess. And one of the things that we do look for is what uh, what my wife calls the ancestral bequest, which is problems that happened maybe 15 generations ago, but were never dealt with. And they've just gone on being passed down the family line from father to son, from mother to daughter, whatever. Um, and then you have to kind of get into that, and you have to find a way to heal it. And, and get past all that and sort out the problems that were still there. Wonderful, wonderful. Now, um, looking at the deck specifically, I've picked three cards, John, and the first one is the Lady of the Sacred Earth, and this is a, a beautiful Celtic horse with these red sacred markings on, 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 the, on the horse, standing on a hill with a rising sun, looks like a moon overhead, and various other stars. Uh, and one foot seems to be uh, touching a fire. What can you say about this um, card? 
Well, you may notice that um, also on the card, there's a very abstract looking head coming in on one side. That is, in fact, um, based on the White Horse of Uffington, which is one of the extraordinary Chalk Hill figures dating from a very early period and referring to the sacredness of the horse itself. Um, in this context, we wanted to tie that in um, with uh, a, a particular Celtic being um, known as Rhiannon, um, who is herself a kind of horse goddess. Um, and so we wanted to tie all that idea of uh, Rhiannon as the, uh, the one who uh, looks after the world and after the earth in particular and our relationship to it. And it goes through all of the, the times, both the day and the night, which is why we've got sun and moon. And it's also a card of vision. So the horse that is striking the hillside is in fact bringing that flame to life, that flame being the flame of vision. It's a beautiful card. I love the colours of it. Really, well, Cheska Potter, who did this, the work on this, was a very, very talented woman, and uh, you know, she really understood the vision. I think uh, very deeply. Well, the second card I have, John, is the sun, and this is again a card with a blue background, and there's a looks like a figure of a warrior. There's a a, a male head. It looks like a youth. There's a looks like a reindeer, um, and another perhaps reindeer above spirals, and at the bottom. I'm not sure if that's they're greyhounds, those kind of Celtic knot type forms of greyhounds. What what about this card? Well, the the main emphasis of this card is a Celtic deity known as Mabon, which simply means sun. Um, Mabon, son of Modron, son, son of mother, in other words. Uh, and he represents all of that youthful energy, the energy of the warrior, of course, the energy of the hunter, um, and much more the 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 kind of innocence of, of youth. Um, you know, finding his feet in the world for the first time. So he's a, it's a very it's a very powerful card for the young men. Mm, love this card. And the the third one, final one, uh, which I've seen this image before a few places. I think the Lord of the Underworld. And this is a uh, looks like a shaman wearing a kind of reindeer uh, hat with horns, blowing a horn, riding a white horse with two white hounds running beside him. Yeah, actually, this is Aroun, um, who in Celtic, uh, particularly Welsh tradition, is is the lord of the underworld. He's the one who is responsible for, uh, for for spirits who live in the underworld. He's also known as the lord of the beasts. And this card actually depicts him uh, riding out from the other world with his white hounds, who all have red ears, um, by the way, sometimes said to have been dipped in blood. Mm -hmm. uh, and they're basically riding out in search of spirits or, the, or, the, or the, the spirits of those who have passed over and who need to be helped into the other world. So he's both a very fearsome character uh, and, and, a, and one that's very powerful and very helpful at times. So when you're sorting out problems that are particularly difficult, he's a great ally to have at your back. So this, this deck really draws on a lot of ancient archetypal energies. The, the question is, the, are these energies still available to us in the modern world? Very much so, yes. I mean, that's the whole object of the Celtic uh, tradition and of the shamanic tradition uh, is that it enables you to encounter these beings. Uh, you know, the whole idea of the deck, it's not like a, a, a tarot exactly. Um, it's more designed to be used as, a, as, as kind of gateways. The images themselves are gateways to help you to communicate and come in, become in touch with these uh, archetypal beings and the archetypal forces behind them. Right. Could they be used, say, for meditation, meditating on an image at a time? Yes, uh, that's one of the things that we very much hoped people would do, and I know that a lot of the people who use them will, in fact, put them up, sometimes even in a frame. Uh, I know someone who keeps three or four of these cards on the mantelpiece all the time, looks at them every day, and then changes them for another four, and so you become very familiar with them in that way. But in a more formal sense, if you put a card up and you you look at it for a long time until the image is really in your mind and then you close your eyes and you start to meditate and very often then you make the communication with the, with this being so john look thank you so much for sharing uh, this information with me i know you've written a lot you've done loads of tarot decks and this one is one that really are beautiful the images are absolutely fantastic so all the best john and uh, i hope to catch up with you for tea one day okay thank you welcome